Okay, well, I'm almost done with my coverage of noddings, um, but I want to talk about one more aspect of her theory, which is basically the connection with feminism. And this is a very common connection between uh, ethics of care, and ethics of caring um, and of care, and feminism. So some important background here is that Carol Gilligan, uh, another feminist author, uh, more of a psychologist writing about um, human psychological development, uh, had, had already engaged in a debate with Kohlberg, who was, a moral, was himself a moral psychologist. So interested in basically how um, children develop their sense of morality, of the difference between right and wrong. And Kohlberg had famously proposed that there were six stages of moral development. And these were, uh, in his account, increasingly sophisticated and increasingly, um, increasingly adult or mature. Uh, all right. So the idea here is that steps steps five and six are better than they're more advanced than steps three and four, which in turn are more advanced than steps one and two. So one and two were the pre-conventional stage, as he described it, and these include basically just doing things um, to get uh, what one wants. But then in the three and four stages, one recognizes that there are other people and that it, um, the best policy would be to act in ways that involve being liked by others, okay? And so that, and that includes things like being nice, forming strong bonds with others, okay? And so that conventional stage um, includes basically uh, moral, a kind of moral um, orientation that's associated with getting along with others and having others um, be happy with one's behavior. Okay, and then finally at the five and six level, according to Kohlberg, we have post-conventional moralities. Uh, conventional here, by the way, just means um, like according to conventions or according to the way that people in a group operate. So um, the post-conventional uh, level, according to Kohlberg, was basing decisions on universal principles, okay? So something like the principle of utility or the categorical imperative, some kind of relatively abstract and general principle or universal principle, a principle that could be applied um, for all times and places, that whenever it's applied, it gives the right answer. Uh, that this kind of decision making was the most advanced so that by the time children become adults, they should, if they've developed well, if they've developed normally and naturally and healthily and they have good ethical, uh, good ethical psychology, then they should arrive at the point where they um, answer the question of the difference between the right and wrong thing to do by appeal to principles like it's always wrong to cheat or it's always wrong to lie, okay? Um, or uh, it's always wrong to cause suffering unnecessarily and so on. So Carol Gilligan criticized Kohlberg's views in the following way. She pointed out that caring is a big part of, arguably a big part, of what it means to be a good person. So if you think about what is an ethically good person like, one account that you could give of that would, in, would involve uh, emphasizing how caring a person is. For instance, how attuned are they to the emotions of those around them? How much sensitivity do they, do they have to what other people need and what other people want from them? And um, if they have a higher sensitivity, how willing are they to sacrifice and to um, uh, make sure that people around them get the things that they want and need, okay? So that's a kind of uh, caring approach to what it is that morality is about. Gilligan pointed out that um, even though caring is an arguably an important part of ethics, um, it seems to fall more into three and four than it does into five and six, because when one person cares for another, they don't generally do it by appeal to some universal principle. They don't say, 
well, it's always right to care for others, so I will care for others. No, they just pay attention to others and try to help them get what they want, okay, um, and, and what they need. So uh, it seems to be more like a conventional morality. And in fact, it looks a lot like the things that Kohlberg described as conventional morality, being nice and being liked by others, okay? So caring, uh, Gilligan argued, seems to fall into three and four more than five and six, but it's arguably as important to morality as five and six is. I, I say arguably, meaning one could argue that, or it, it makes sense from a certain perspective to say that it's as important as five and six, okay? Um, but Carol Gilligan goes on to argue, caring has traditionally been something that women have done better than men. And so it looks like Kohlberg's theory is unjustifiably biased, not just against caring, which it does indeed seem to be biased against care as part of the complete picture of what an ethical person is like, but it also seems to be biased against women, since women have traditionally been in caring roles and have traditionally exemplified a kind of caring attitude and pattern of life um, better than men have. If you think about traditional male and female roles, I'm talking like 1950s and earlier, okay, um, the traditional roles, at least in like West, um, in, in the United States and in Europe, and probably most people, most places around the world, the traditional role have been that women are caretakers, right? They heal the sick. The, the nurse, nursing staffs are primarily composed of women, not men. Um, that, uh, that women take care of children, right? Women are the primary caretakers of children. They, their, their roles in, are, are often roles of mothers more than anything else, okay? And so mothers and sometimes wives, right, taking care of their husbands. So this idea of care seems to be a big part of what women have done in the course of human history. And so it seems again like Kohlberg's picture is biased against women. And since um, Kohlberg's picture is repeating uh, some themes or attitudes of the larger and longer standing Western tradition of ethical theory, including an emphasis on universal rights and principles as the standard of morality, universal principles as the kind of um, best answer to the question of what we should do and how we should tell what we should do, okay? Because of that, it seems like this argument also unveils or reveals a anti-female bias in the entire Western philosophical tradition, the entire Western ethical tradition, right? That all of the major ethical theory traditions, Aristotle, Kant, and um, utilitarianism, they all uh, don't notice this feature of feeling, sentiment, and caring, and how important they are to morality. And finally, Noddings offers an explanation as to why women tend to do more caring and caretaking roles and men tend to do less of this. Also an explanation for why men may be more inclined to think of morality in a universalizing and abstract way, whereas women may be more inclined to think about morality in a contextual and situational and um, caring type of way, okay? Uh, also a more emotive, that is emotional kind of way than men may be thinking about morality. So um, there are two kinds of explanations she gives here. So one kind of explanation is just cultural. This is probably the more familiar type of explanation that we have when we notice differences, general behavioral differences between um, men and women. We say, okay, well, you know, as, as um, Noddings also says, we start out by saying, clearly we're not talking about all men and all women here. We're just talking about generalizations or we're talking about um, statistical, slightly greater statistical likelihood that any given man will exhibit these traits in comparison with any given woman. So that's very different from saying that 
for instance, um, all men have a gene that makes them a certain way or that men are innately a certain way. It's rather saying that um, in, in general, if we look at a large group, we look at thousands of men or thousands, thousands of men and thousands of women, we'll find that there's a greater number within that thousand that exhibit a certain character attribute uh, in one group than in the other. Okay, so that's a very, that's, we got to be clear here, we're not claiming that people are inevitably a certain way because of their gender. That's not what um, Noddings is claiming, okay? Uh, but she gives two explanations as to why there may be this kind of um, uh, pattern difference between uh, groups of men and groups of women. And the, and the first explanation is cultural. We basically um, teach women to act a certain way. We encourage them to be caring rather than uh, rather than distant and objective and um, and principled and uh, severe in their judgments and uncompromising in their judgments. We don't encourage women to do those things. Whereas we do, to some extent, encourage men to do those things. We, we somehow uh, often, it seems, encourage men to stand by their convictions and um, don't back down and things like that. Okay. Whereas women are encouraged more to be conciliatory and compromise and look for a way to make things um, easier for themselves and the people around them. Okay. So that would naturally, if the, if if individuals were indeed encouraged in those ways because of a kind of uh, bias in the culture, then that would indeed encourage women to be more caring and men to be less caring and more abstract and universalizing. But Noddings also gives a second uh, possible explanation. And this one is interesting. It's more psychological than cultural, having to do with the development of men and women in, um, in uh, childhood. Okay, so the basic idea is this, that women tend to be closer to their children than men do because of the physical phenomenon of breastfeeding and actually giving birth to children. So the fact that women carry their children in their bodies before they, I mean, if we're talking about biological children, that they carry their biological children in their bodies for nine, for roughly nine months before delivering them. Um, and then they feed them with their own bodies for a period of time. Okay. Kind of, uh, forces mothers and their children to be closer than fathers and their children are. So the experience of that for a child is that children generally feel closer to their mother than they do to their father. They experience their father as more distant than their mother, okay? And then what that generates is for female children, as they get older, they identify with the mother because they're, they are themselves female as well. And so the, a female child will think, I should be like my mother. I should be caring to others since they were so cared for by their mother. Whereas male children will think, because they're male and their father is male, they will think I should be detached and distant because that's what my father was like. I shouldn't be um, so caring because that would make me more like my mother, which is not who I am because I'm male, not female, okay? And uh, you may disagree with this. Um, I think to some extent, this second explanation sounds a little bit old fashioned to our ears today. Um, this book was written in 1984 and uh, we might be inclined to kind of second guess the extent to which these generalizations about how caring mothers are for their children in comparison with fathers. On the other hand, um, it is still true that women are the only ones who can carry babies in their bodies and can breastfeed, right? So those things seem to be um, reasons to think that children will uh, be closer, at least in their er very early years, will be physically closer with their mothers than their fathers on average. Anyway, that's enough about noddings. There's quite a lot of material um, in this that we've drawn out. Uh, and I will leave you to the discussion boards and the reading response to write what you have to say about it.